Now, back to Ward and L on Canada Talks. Well, you know, initially the, the title of this film was Piano Man, The Spirit of Rock and Roll. And uh, I immediately changed it because I'm not a huge fan of Billy Joel. And right. I didn't want anyone to uh, confuse the two. Oh, and they would have. And they would have. Yes. They definitely would have. And you know, if you that, say Piano Man now, that's actually what people end up thinking a, a lot of times. I know, is, I know. And that's why I changed the, the title uh, to, to Van's name. And, of course, he called himself, and officially it was printed on those Atlantic labels, Van Piano Man Walls. That was in the 40s and the 50s. So it preceded Mr. Joel by three decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did he give himself the name Piano Man? He did indeed, yes. Okay, because I've always wanted a nickname, but I always felt weird <laughs> about just assigning myself one. But well, if why it, not? It worked for him, so maybe I'm going to try it. Now, tell the listeners a little bit about Van Walls. Van, Wal Van Walls is the most unknown um, of the greats. Van was uh, a humble kind of a guy. He, Sorry to mix metaphors, he... He did not toot his own horn, even if he was a piano player. And that, works, that worked against his reputation over time. But it was his personality. He left that to other people, and other people didn't do the job. So he concentrated on, on um, speaking with his hands. I have to admit that before this documentary, I didn't know who Van Walls was. Uh, what... Is how did you? When did you first learn about him, and what made you say, "Well, I'm going to tell this man's story"? Um, I met him the first time at McGill University in Montreal in 1990. I was taking a non-credit course there on the history of the blues, and um, the, the the professor, Dr. Morrison, said, "Hey, don't miss next week. I've got a real surprise for you." And the following week, uh, Van walked in, and he sat down at that uh, faculty upright, and he played like a fallen angel, and I was like ten feet away from him. And um, for the life of me, I can't remember how it happened, but I ended up in his home. And um, over Were you invited or did you break in? I, <laughs> I think his wife invited me. Okay. She was the gregarious <laughs> type. And, right? um, New nickname, Third Wheel Morris. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, very slowly, because Van was totally against the idea. He had no interest whatsoever. Uh, I came to the conclusion that maybe we should make a, a film about him, despite his recalcitrance. But uh, once I learned that, one, he wanted to be paid to be interviewed, which is against documentary film principles, mm -hmm. and two, that he wanted to make an album. I mean, those old, those old blue guys, they expected to be paid. Yeah. Once I got those two things uh, figured out, and I'm a slow learner, uh, we started to make serious film about him. And he really wanted to make one last album before he passed on. He had this incredible history at Atlantic Records uh, back in the 40s and 50s. And uh, he knew he was getting on. He was in his late 70s, early 80s. And so uh, we did the album. We, we filmed the entire process. And in the editing room, we decided to hang the story of Van Piano Man Walls on the making of that album. That's how it came together. That's great. And like a lot of uh, R&B and early R&B blues musicians, he was working his entire life. He was working as young as his teens, but he didn't really start to get recognition until later in life. He lived to entertain. He played his, the piano his entire life. His mother taught him to play when he was seven years old. And uh, he quit school relatively early and became a professional musician young. And... Um, you know, uh, I used to visit, hit, visit him in the hospital when he was sick with cancer. And um, he played for the patients on the cancer ward. When he, he, he played up until the day that he could not get out of bed. He played his entire life. It's always amazing to me, people who have that drive in them, I think. Because, I mean, we're, you know, Ward and I are entertainers and we're comedians. But if someone said, you know what, you don't have to tell jokes anymore, I'd be like... Well, all right. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't <laughs> seek. If, if for some reason I couldn't do it anymore, I wouldn't try to find a place, probably. Um, as much as I love entertaining, I would probably just be like, yeah, okay, I'll be reading books. Um, and so there's something I think so special about someone who it's just part of who they are. Um, was he... Th you know, the first time, obviously his music, when you listened to it, was so compelling. But when you first met him and spoke with him, w was he that kind of person that was just, you needed to know more about him? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, he used to sit 
in his apartment. Um, he lived in a small three and a half down in Ville La Salle in Montreal, and he had three keyboards stacked. And he, he as I said earlier, he, he, he preferred to play music, but he played hours and hours every day. His wife would scream at him, you haven't played prayers today. So he'd rip off 30 minutes of this funkified spiritual stuff, you know? Mm. He, it, it, it was his raison d'être. It's what drove him. And that, of course, I knew I had a fantastic entertainer as a subject. I knew that, that he was photogenic. I, know, I knew that he would be very appealing as an entertainer. Um, the, 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 um, the curious aspect is I, I wasn't sure how I was going to make him become forthcoming about his own story. Right. To, to get him to talk. But, you know, he used, he used to like medicine in his coffee, which, which was a metaphor for, uh, or a euphemism, rather, for uh, bourbon. <laughs> so <laughs> when I finally got him down at a, at a beautiful grand piano with a proper film crew and sound crew, we slipped some medicine into his coffee, and that opened him up a bit, finally. We are speaking to filmmaker Stephen Flicks Morris about his <laughs> documentary all about Van Walls also known as The Piano Man. I want to play a little of this. This is Van Walls and the Rockets. Open the door. Open the door, baby. Baby, please. Open the door. Come on, Freddy. Open the door. But you can, you can hear... Some serious finger work there. It's a signature sound. Yeah. Van, Vans was a signature. He's immediately identifiable. And, and what is it? What is it that makes him immediately identifiable, to, especially to people like you who, who know his sound so well? He loved the high notes because he, he said to me the, the ladies loved the high notes. So he, was, he had a very powerful right hand and in the upper register. But he was very smooth and subtle with his left hand in the, the lower registers. So his, his uh, style is really identifiable. And he wasn't just a session guy. You know, he was an arranger. Sure. He was a composer. He was a, an orchestra leader. And so he, he could do it all. But I guess his, his real reputation is, is backing up other people in a, in a very special way. And he played on hundreds and hundreds of tracks. I feel like his wife must have all, it, been a music lover also because... To have him play hours a day and then for her to call out songs that or things he hadn't played yet that day. I have to be honest. If it was me, I'd be like, can you stop with the piano for five <laughs> minutes? Uh, so she must have been a special lady in her own right. Yeah, she, uh, she, she saw him the first time at the, the famous Esquire show bar in Montreal. And um, Montreal has a wide open reputation still, but back in those days it was crazy. And there was a, a huge uh, army base in Plattsburgh, New York, just across the border. And, and the guys would come up on leave for three or four days. And um, so the, um, those black groups had a, a, a circuit, and Montreal was part of it. Montreal was part of it. She walked in one night, and she said, I just didn't walk out. She fell in love with them the second that she saw them. And sh this is a white Jewish woman who fell in love with a, 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 a black Baptist yeah. And they fell in love. And, of course, this is the end of the 50s. They couldn't go back to the States together. Yeah. So he, he stayed in Montreal for love and drifted almost immediately into obscurity. It's such a great love story. Yeah. You know, and I, when we were even talking earlier in the show about how I'm not a real sucker for love stories, uh, but I got to admit, that one tugs the heartstrings. Well, you know, no relationship is perfect. They had mm -hmm. their ups and downs. And, and he was a, you know, musicians are always on the road all the time. And they're yeah. notoriously wild. Yeah. And um, so she just, to solve that problem, she just said, I'm going on the road with them. So they, they love to throw everything into the backseat of the car and take off for a gig, you know, a gig south of nowhere. And listen, he played in these villages like Trois Pistoles and Drummondville and, and towns up in, in the, in the Beauce and north of Quebec City. Mm -hmm. like, he did it for 30 years. He played in taverns, legions, music halls, uh, uh, motel lounges. He, w he was doing whatever he could to pay the rent. But he never gave up, and he never uh, gave up the, the dream of making another album in his style, pure rhythm and blues and blues. 
And he, he's a guy who's, you know, he's born in Kentucky, but, you know, he lived out his remaining years in Canada. And I think that, uh, was it mostly also because, you know, rhythm and blues, especially old, you know, I guess what I'm looking for, 40s and 50s rhythm and blues was is so popular in Canada and especially in parts of Quebec like Montreal? Well, it's uh, music is a cyclical business too. Yeah. A lot of people said that uh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago that the blues was dead. But you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, he came around and the yeah. blues was really big again. And the same thing kind of happened to Van. He ten the last 10 years of his life he increasingly was uh, recognized as uh, the pioneer that he was and he got some really important gigs. And the album had a lot to do with it too. Being nominated for a Juno uh helped his popularity. He had some choice uh, gigs before he passed on and that's got to feel good to you too because i mean you helped put that album together put the album together I produced that album yes but yeah. I, I did it with a lot of help there was a blue society in montreal um they um they were very uh helpful in getting a concert together that was uh, recorded by cbc radio and it went out across the nation and um that developed more interest too in van and so he started to think, yes, this is a, a, a possibility. I can make a, an album. I can make one last album. How long, first of all, how long did you film for the documentary? And then how long in total from sort of once you sold him on the idea till the documentary was finished? How long was that? I met Van in 1990 at McGill University. I filmed him for the first time to see if he was photogenic. Boy, I shouldn't have asked myself that. He was really sharp on camera. Um, Started from f filming him professionally, I would say, about 1995. That's when he finally agreed. And then he passed away, uh, I think, in 1999. But then I had to do these other interviews with these seminal figures in the history of rock, rock and roll and R&B, uh, specifically Jerry Wexler, who uh, coined the term. You know, they used to call that kind of music race music. And Jerry Wexler was offended by that. And he insisted that Billboard change it, and it became rhythm and blues. So I couldn't make a film without uh, an interview with him. The problem was, for 10 years, he refused to meet me. He refused to talk to me politely. And so I, I couldn't release the film for all that time because there were some crucial elements that either they were too busy to see me or they didn't want to see me. I mean, I finally got Wexler when he was 88. Wow. So, this, I mean, this has to be a real labor of love for you. Because to have that love... Because I think there's... Pr and maybe I'm doing a disservice to any filmmaker, but I have to imagine there's some filmmakers that will go, okay, I'll find a way to do the story without them. But y you just said, no, it's, this needs to be done. This wasn't a scripted film. Mm -hmm. I followed the camera. I let the camera decide well, who's next. You mm -hmm. know, and, and once Van had passed on, then I, I started to see, well, the story is more than just Van. And because there was aspects of his story that he would not tell me, I had to get other people to tell his uh, side of the story. So I had to track down Ruth Brown, who really, she created Atlantic Records with her success. They would have gone bankrupt otherwise. And she was very forthcoming. Of course, there was Amit Erdogan, the founder of Atlantic, the son of the Turkish ambassador to the United States. Very sophisticated gentleman. Um, I had to interview him. Um, mm -hmm. He's the greatest, perhaps, pr producer of his era. You know, he produced everybody. Um, um, and others, other, Howell Beagle, the lawyer who pro bono set, the, uh, set up the Rhythm and Blues Foundation. He was too busy to see me for all those years, so I finally got him in Boston in 2011. You know, so it, it, I did other things. Um, you know, I've sure. worked in other fields. But uh, I kept going back to this because it was my passion. So telling this story is kind of like your piano. Well said. I, no one's ever said that to me before. And I, I find it very moving that you would say that. In a way, mm. it's true. Sticky fingers has a way with words. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my ability to play a, a musical instrument during this process, too, you know. So uh, it means a lot to me that you would call it my, my well, way of playing it, the piano. That's, yeah. you know, just how it strikes me is that... Uh, you you know you had to make you had to tell the story and you knew you had to tell it the right way and you just never gave up on it you well, know I'll tell you something he really I'm, wanted one last album right and you had to make this movie yeah 
And I promised him on his deathbed that I would finish the story. It's the only time he ever inquired about the film. He never asked me if he could see an image. He never asked me if he could see a rough cut. He never asked me if he could see an assembly. He couldn't have cared less. Wow. So, but on, you know, I guess he was thinking of his legacy by this point, you know. Yeah. And he, he said, so what about that film? I said, Van, I promise you I'll finish it. And so the movie is showing at North by Northeast? Wow. When they called and said, you're in, I almost fainted. I mean, this is a, a festival that I have watched grow for 20 years. A friend of mine a, a, was a musician and then became a record company owner. And so I've watched this, uh, this festival from afar for all this time. And, um, you know, they had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications. And so to be chosen uh, by North by Northeast is a, a true honor. It's pretty amazing how, and even in the last few years, it seems like it, it's a festival that's just really exploded. You know, it was, um, they, it's been a slow build for a long time. And then the last few years just seem like it's North by Northeast is on the map. Correct me if I'm wrong too. It, it almost feels like it's the beginning of the festival season as well. And they really yeah. s- make a splash. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, you can find out more about the movie at vanpianomanwalls.com. That's all one word. It's V-A-N-N, vanpianomanwalls.com. And we'll tweet that out. And uh, best of luck to you on this documentary. It's it's great to see a labor of love Can, come true for somebody. Do you mind if I mention when the screening is? By oh, all of means. course, it's, yes. It's Sunday at the beautifully renovated Bloor Cinema on Bloor Street. Sunday, Father's Day. Uh, 12.30 in the afternoon. Come on out. It's wonderful. And it's a great movie and uh, great to be seen on the big screen. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. All right.